All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for coming to the economics session. Uh, my name is Stephanie Herter, and today I'm going to be talking about my paper, uh, Blockchain Upgrade is a Coordination Game. So this is taking an economic lens to the eternal question of how to design blockchain governance. So this is a paper that's joint with Kathy Barrera. Kathy and I are both founding economists at Prism Group. So at Prism Group, we work with blockchain projects to help them with their economics and governance design. And so I have a uh, PhD in economics from Harvard where I was actually office mates with Jacob, who just spoke. So having spoken at a lot of blockchain conferences, um, I like to come in as a bit of an economics evangelist. So I want to talk a little bit about why you know, economics, I think, is a really good complement to computer science when we're thinking about the design of blockchain platforms. So you know, at a fundamental level, computers are programmable, right? So if we think about when we're writing a program, we have to think about what are all the different conditions that can occur, you know, what kinds of variation might come up that we need to take into account, but we know that the computer's gonna do what we program it to do. On the other hand, people are not programmable, right? They have free will, and they make decisions based on what they perceive to be in their own self-interest. So you know, a miner is not just gonna come and mine because we tell them to, Right? It has to be in their own interest to contribute the resources and the rewards have to you know, balance out any costs that they'd receive. However, blockchain platforms need users. They need people to contribute resources and they need users. So the economic design of the platform needs to be such that the platform aligns the individual incentives with what, with what the platform needs. And so we really think of these two disciplines as great complements along with lots of other fields, you know, legal, marketing, business strategy, you know, the whole Lots of disciplines need to come together to help blockchain succeed, but we think these are two of the big ones. Now, and today I'm gonna to talk a little, about, a little bit about an economic view of blockchain governance. So as many of you know, the design of decentralized governance has been a bit of a challenge for the industry. And I think that this is a place that economics as a field can help contribute. So economists have been dis studying um, collective decision-making for almost a century. Uh, so for those of you who follow the Nobel Prize in economics, Kenneth Arrow won in 1972 for his impossibility theorem, right? And this is based on work that he did in the 40s and 50s. And this has been extended to looking at political economy and all other organizations and different types of decision-making environments. So this is a place where there's potentially gains from applying economic thought. And what's really interesting about a blockchain environment it's actually distinct from most settings in which governance or decision making has been studied is that we have the possibility of hard forks, right? So in most of the deci collective decision making contexts that we are in on a regular basis, whether it's government elections or organizations, secession is costly, right? You know, so for example, I live in LA and as many of you know, after the 2016 election, there was a lot of discussion that the three western states of the United States were going to secede and attach themselves to British Columbia. Lots of people said they were going to move. As far as I know, a lot of that didn't happen because secession is costly, right? So, but instead, in a blockchain environment, the question doesn't become, can I afford to leave? It's, can I get enough other people to go with me that my alternative setting is going to be an attractive one you know, in which to do business? And there are a lot of you know, hard fork evangelists in the blockchain community. This is one of my favorite diagrams. You know, forking is freedom, forking is, and there's, there's a lot of people who say that for, hard forks are always good. And so you know, when thinking about you know, this fundamental question of do we want hard forks to happen, you know, as an economist, it's, it's always kind of weird to hear that something is always good or always bad, right? There are very few things that are always good or always bad, and if we look at you know, the history of hard forks, and this is by no means comprehensive, right? This is sort of a partial list. We've got a couple of, just looking at Bitcoin forks, we have a couple of Bitcoin forks that have done relatively well, they've sustained themselves. Actually, since we wrote the paper six months ago, we've had one up here, that's Bitcoin SV, and Bitcoin Private, I believe, is, has met its demise. And on the other hand, you have, you know, about a bazillion Bitcoin forks that have died. So. It's not immediately obvious to me that we can say that all hard forks are good or all hard forks are bad. And so the questions we want to raise come from debates that we've seen you know, in the blockchain community. So the first one is, all right, 
how do we think about whether a fork is good for a community or not? Like, is, rather than just getting into an argument and you know, fighting to the death based on our ideologies, is there some way that we can bring sort of a rigorous framework to thinking about whether, when hard forks are good and when hard forks are bad? And then the second question I want to raise is how can governance procedures, and specifically voting procedures, impact when hard forks occur and when they don't? So one thing we hear a lot as the blockchain community explores governance is, you know, if we could just find the right voting procedure to make decisions, this would cure us of bad forks, right? If we just found the right voting procedure, forks would go away. And so again, addressing this question rigorously and saying, like, let's take a couple of the voting procedures that we see being used all the time, and let's see to what extent they can actually coordinate us on good forks when they, we want them to and prevent bad forks from happening. And again, just to step back and talk about this in a little bit more of an economic framework, you know, building on what I said before that people make decisions that are generally in their own best interest, is that when we design governance, the governance procedures have to be what's called incentive compatible, right? So we want governance procedures that lead us to a good community outcome, but they need to be designed in such a way that it is in individuals' best interest to participate and in some cases participate truthfully, right? So we always have to keep this in mind. And the other thing I want to spend just a couple minutes talking about before I dig into the math of the paper is this question of the role of economic design. So we talk to a lot of projects who say, you know, they've developed their technology and they don't want to talk about the economic design because they think that it will impede the freedom of the, of the users of their platform, right? That freedom is good, freedom is helpful, and if we impose economic institutions or constraints, this will lead to a lack of utility on behalf of the users. And, you know, ignoring economic design is a choice. You're just saying, I'm not going to deal with this. And so I want to spend a few minutes just illustrating one of many examples of how imposing, you know, economic institutions actually increases welfare for users, right? So it's not necessarily the case that by restricting freedom, you're actually going to result in worse outcomes. So I'd like to take a detour through the world of market design and tell you a little bit about the residency match. Uh, so this is actually work that is done by Professor Al Roth, who's two buildings down. Um, how many of you have known someone who has been a, a, a medical doctor, a medical student, and has gone through the match? All right, so a lot of you are familiar with the match. So for those of you who aren't, if you're in the United States and you're a medical student, your first job after med school is what's called a residency, and you get your residency assignment through a centralized algorithm. Right? So you apply and you go for interviews, and then all of the jobs and all of the applicants submit a rank order list. Right? They say, here's my first choice, my second choice, my third choice. They run this big algorithm, and then you get a letter in the mail that says, congratulations, you're moving to you know, University of Hawaii or wherever you were planning to go. And so this system has been in place for over a century, and it's gone through phases of sort of success and failure. It sort of goes in and out. And so in the mid-90s, this match was having the problem that people were not using it. And the reason was actually that um, doctors, medical students were marrying each other, right? But they had to enter the match separately. So spouses would enter and one would get assigned to California and the other one would get assigned to Ohio and they'd say, this is terrible. So they'd try to find jobs on their own, right? And what's actually been documented in subsequent studies is this is bad for them, right? The jobs that they were getting through the centralized mechanism were actually better for their careers than the ones they could find on their own. And so you know, the, the organization that runs the match came to a couple of economists, including Professor Roth, in the mid-90s, and they said, you know, no one's using our match. Can you please help us fix this? Right? And we want people to come and use the match and enter it, and then we want people to abide by their recommendations. Right? And so the team that was designing this took a fresh look at the algorithm that was being used to match doctors to, to jobs. And they formed a hypothesis, which was that um, out marketplaces, you know, they looked at many different marketplaces that were using these kinds of centralized algorithms, and they said, we have this hypothesis that marketplaces that are using algorithms that result in what are called stable matchings are going to be successful, and they're going to persist, and ones that don't are not. Um, so there's a lot of observational data. You can see it in this table. Um, that supported this. And the, the idea of stability is basically that you don't want an outcome where two people want to leave their match and run off with each other, 
right? As long as there's no sort of job and doctor pair who want to run off and you know, not abide by the, the recommendation, the match is stable. And so through a combination of observational data and lab experiments, they hypothesized that you know, implementing a, a stable mechanism would result in a, um, a marketplace that persisted. And so they tried this, and it worked. And this algorithm is now used in you know, countless matching markets in multiple different kinds of disciplines. And so what I want you to take away from this is that this actually, imposing this kind of centralized design actually improved the outcomes for everybody. Right? The doctors got better jobs than they would have if they had to look on their own. The hospitals got better applicants. You know, this was structure that helped people achieve more value. And so with that sort of economic lesson in mind, I want to talk a little bit about the problem of governance and governance design. And so the thing I'd like you to take from this is that you know, designing governance and imposing institutions is not necessarily a bad thing. And in fact, it may be necessary for blockchain platforms to survive. So we're thinking about a world where um, we have a unit mass of, of blockchain users. So these are you know, people in the community um, who are using a particular blockchain. And a debate comes up about a policy change. And you can think of this as like a change in the block size, right? And there's gonna be the status quo, which is what's going now, and then there's the proposed upgrade. And so we're gonna use this value function called VIJ, which is the value to a user i, so that's just their index, of participating on a chain with policy j, along with a fraction of the community x. And the key thing here is that um, this system exhibits network effects, right? I don't wanna be on a blockchain by myself, I benefit from having people with me. So when I'm thinking about the value I get from a particular blockchain, there's a trade-off of how much do I like the policy and how many other people do I have with me. And there are gonna be two types of users. So one type of user prefers the status quo, the other one prefer, uh, prefers the upgrade, and the variable beta, which you will see later, um, is the fraction that prefer each. And so the first question I want to explore before we get into the governance design is when are forks good for the community? So how do we think about when a fork is socially optimal in some definition? And we also want to think about when forks can be Nash equilibria, right? So it's, all right, there we go, thank you. Um, <laughs> I'm just gonna keep going. So first we want to, we want to understand, you know, when do we see a hard fork as an equilibrium? So when do we have it that two chains are what we see as the equilibrium outcome of individuals making decisions? And then when is, this, when is having two chains what we would call social welfare maximizing? And we're gonna look at two different definitions of social welfare that come from an area that's called welfare economics. So one definition is called total surplus maximization. It's literally just what maximizes the total value in the community. And the other is called Pareto optimality, which just means that you can't make one group of people better without making another group worse, right? And so what we find, and again, this is a, a high-level diagram, and the way I want you to think about this is that this line is beta. So this is the fraction of the users who prefer the status quo, right? So if we're all the way over on this side, the, um, everybody prefers the upgrade. If we're over there, everybody prefers the status quo. And so what you see as very stylized results is that a hard fork in some circumstances can be sur total surplus maximizing. So this is sort of the gold standard um, of what we're looking for. But this doesn't always have to exist, right? And it is rare, in fact, that hard forks are total surplus maximizing. Secondly, we can have a set of outcomes where hard forks are not even a Nash equilibrium. So what happens here is that if you were to take the blockchain community and were to split it into two chains, they would actually just by themselves combine back together. Right, and you see this when one of the two policies doesn't have enough support, right? So the five people who prefer one policy are on their own chain and they say this is terrible and then they go back. The third set, and I think this is really interesting, is that these are, um, a hard fork can be what's called Pareto optimal. So you can have a hard fork where if you were to take the two chains and combine them back together, one of the two groups would be strictly worse off. And this always exists. So there's always a case that for a certain po um, population, or a certain co um, composition of the population, a hard fork can be Pareto optimal. 
So that's good to know, and that's the definition of optimality we're going to use going forward. And finally, we have this section, which is what one might call the Brexit section. Um, so this is when a hard fork is in Nash equilibrium, but is not Pareto optimal. So the users of the, the community have ex post regret. Everybody wishes that this fork hadn't happened. But without some kind of collective action mechanism to sort of bring everybody back together again, people are stuck in this suboptimal outcome. And no one individually has the power to reconcile um, the two forks. And I just want to point out that, you know, to us, you know, one of the benefits of, of economic theory and economic modeling like this is that it, it helps with the clarity of, you know, if you think about can a, you know, is a fork always good? Is a fork always bad? Under what circumstances are hard forks beneficial for a community? This gives us a framework for thinking about that question, which is way better than just arguing, you know, ad nauseum. And so with that in mind, we then look at the question of, suppose that we have a single blockchain and we're gonna implement a voting procedure, right? And we're gonna say, we're gonna have, you know, this proposed upgrade, we're gonna have people vote on it, and then we're gonna see if people fork after they see what the outcome is. And the question here is, can, you know, is there a type of voting mechanism that can prevent suboptimal forks from occurring? Um, and so the, the two types of policies we're gonna look at here, one of them is majority rule, which you're all familiar with, whoever gets more votes wins, and the other one is called quadratic voting. So this is something that's gotten a lot of momentum, and basically they, Quadratic voting implements the policy that has the higher, um, results in the higher total surplus. So basically, if you have a very, very passionate minority, they'll never win in majority rule, but they could win under um, quadratic voting. And so what we find here is, you know, this is one of those results that has like 18 parts of inequalities. So rather than walk you through that, I'll just tell you that this is a parameter space, and I'm gonna walk you through the types of results. And as you move from left to right, the proposed policy change gets bigger, right? So if you're all the way to the left, it's a little policy change. If you're all the way to the right, it's a big one. And so what we find is the following. First, there are areas where voting is not gonna impact, what the type of voting procedure you choose is not gonna impact whether forks exist. And this happens when the policy change is tiny, and the policy change is huge, right? So if the policy change is tiny, the voting procedure that you pick can impact the policy that gets implemented, but nobody's gonna care enough to leave, right? And then on the other hand, all the way to the other side, you have the area where hard forks are socially optimal, right? We want them to happen. These are the forks that are on net beneficial for the community. The type of voting procedure you're gonna pick isn't gonna impact anything. We want the community to split under these circumstances. In the middle is the interesting section, and this is the section where people have this ex post forking regret. This is the section where if a fork occurs, at least one of the two groups says, wait a minute, I don't like this, can we please reunite? And so if you use majority rule voting, you get these undesirable forks here. If you use quadratic voting, you get undesirable forks here. And so this is really the area where your choice of voting mechanism is actually gonna impact when you're gonna see undesirable hard forks occur. But just a couple of, of comments on this. You know, first, there is, at least among these two voting procedures, neither of them is sort of the bad fork panacea, right? You're always gonna be in some situations where you get a fork and you wish you didn't have one. The second piece is that, well, you might say, you know, if you go back one, let me see if this works, you might just say, okay, well, why don't we just figure out what box we're in, and we'll design the, the voting system that way, right? The difference between these boxes are these very tiny population parameters. There's pretty much no way you would know in advance exactly where you were, right? So it's not like you can just go back and pre-design this. And so I think what this shows is that, you know, the voting mechanism will impact the procedures that get the policies that get implemented, but they're not going to cure undesirable forking as we know it. And so, you know, what do I hope that you take away from this? I think one big piece just from stepping back from a, a different view is that blockchain is really a new economic environment in many ways, right? And what we see now is a lot of the, the voting mechanisms I was talking about 
and the ones that we see in practice are taken from other settings. We say, well, this is working great over here, let's try it in blockchain. That's not always gonna have the results we want because the economics of the setup are different. And so economic thinking is extremely valuable, but you also have to think about the fundamentals of the system. Um, another piece here is that for those of you who are thinking about how to design your blockchain governance, you need to think about more than voting, right? So one thing you might think about is how big, when does a policy get brought in for voting? How big does the change have to be, right? Do we stick with really small and really big changes? Do we allow changes in the middle? How does that process work? You know, a final piece that I didn't get to talk about but is also important is communication, right? So for those of you who, again, keep following the sort of Brexit debacle, there's a lot of discussion about how the information that was presented by the Leave campaign may or may not have been misleading and then, you know, affected the outcomes of the votes. So there's a big piece of this is thinking about how do we disseminate information and make sure it's accurate so that people vote in the way that they want. Um, and then finally, I'll just end with a, a warning that as we think about the design of, of mechanisms for governance, um, we should beware the theoretically perfect but the uh, practically unimplementable mechanism. So there's a, a mechanism in economics called the Vickery-Clark-Groves Vickery mechanism, which is perfect and is rarely, if ever, implementable, right? So we need not just mechanisms that do theoretically what we want, but also ones that we can actually use. Um, and for those of you who might be interested in reading more about the type of work that I'm, that the residency matches in, that Jacob was talking about in his talk, I recommend this book by Al Roth. Um, economic design is used everywhere now. There are lots of books about it. There's lots of interesting research. Um, and, you know, you can highly recommend it. So, in conclusion, um, if you want to get in contact with me, this is my information. Um, the PRISM group will be doing several events at South by Southwest, so if any of you are there, um, I highly recommend, please come and see us. So I think that's it. Thanks for a very interesting talk. Questions? Very good presentation. So uh, I have a question about, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the uh, uh, governance design for Polkadot. So basically they have a design where um, if there's a unanimity, uh, a, like in, within the committee, like there's a very high probability adoption of policy, but like as long uh, as one person disagrees, um, the probability of adoption is like decreased by a lot. So uh, to accommodate for the possibility. So the argument is that if everybody agrees, and, and it must be a software bug. Like, it's something that um, people, like, it's an unintended error. But as long as one person disagrees, the uh, likelihood is a uh, software bug decreases by a lot. So what do you think that kind of design? Right, so I won't comment too much without having their, their stuff in front of me, but it sounds like that one potential person has an awful lot of power. So there's a, definitely, it sounds like there's an opportunity to sway the results significantly. Hey, thanks, uh, great talk. I'm an economist too, political economist. Awesome. In, in the end, you were saying that, um, yeah, it's a, it's a new economical environment, but uh, so the question is, that don't you think that the economics should change too? You know, that uh, maybe, maybe there is opening a possibility that we can rethink what, what value is, what rational behavior is. Well, unfortunately, we don't have an hour to answer that. I think it's a great point. Um, I think that a, lot, a good amount of the, the work that's been done on how individuals make decisions, and that includes both sort of standard theory and behavioral economics, will be very useful. And I think that there will be a lot of ways, there will be lessons on what not to do. <laughs> um, but I, I do think that, you know, it will be interesting to see, for example, how behavior of actors changes in sort of a crypto setting compared to other ones. Hi, um, thank you for um, thank you for the talk. It's good to hear from more economists. Um, I'm curious if you have any thoughts on governance outside of a fork situation, again, more of a continuous 
ongoing setting of a parameter, like say the block size or a savings rate or um, an interest rate, things like that? I think that's a good question. I mean, just ex ante, that would be very tough to design because there's going to be sort of the, the nominal number and the practical implementation of it. So you probably want to think about things sort of in more in buckets. Um, but just in general, I think the, the takeaway from this is that, you know, whatever you implement is probably going to need to be pretty bespoke, right? There's probably not going to be a system out there that you can just copy and paste and, and do what you need. Um, I have one question. Um, you do look at the notion of correlated equilibrium, um, which is uh, like a re relaxation of Nash equilibrium, and presumably it assumes like a founding team that designs, you, when you design the, the, the blockchain, you, you have the core, core client that you're designing, and then it serves like a public uh, sort of beacon of co coordinating uh, party. Yeah. No, I think that's a great point. Um, obviously, coordination mechanisms play a big role in a lot of communities, and you even see them forming in, in blockchains that don't have formal governance, whether it's through you know, meetings in hotel rooms or um, eminent thinkers who we, who we all know. So I think it's, it's a really good point. Um, we haven't formally looked at correlated equilibrium, but I think those types of mechanisms are really important to think about and include. Okay, thanks a lot. Let's thank the speaker again. All right. Thanks, everyone.